I'm Stumpy Nubs, this is Mustache Mike, and welcome to another edition of Behind the Sawdust, which rarely means that our behinds are full of sawdust. This week we have a big announcement from SawStop, we wonder where Robert Lang is, Paul Sellers turns 25, we tell you what to do with $1,200 in Las Vegas, show you how to collect dust on your lathe, investigate another possible scam, look at cordless power drills, and give away another WorkSharp 3000. But first, the woodworking news. Jeff Burks spent 50 years in an 1838 mill, and he didn't even have to leave home to do it. What Jeff has done is he shared with us an 1888 article written by a man who began woodworking as a boy, riving shingles by hand for $2 per thousand. And he went on to make a life among the mills and the trees of 19th century Maine. It's a fascinating read that takes us back to the days when woodworking was a much more difficult task. I highly recommend it. So what we've done is put a link below in our show notes. Not all miters require reinforcements. That's according to Matthew Kenny, senior editor at Fine Woodworking Magazine. He says it's a common misconception that all miter joints are weak when assembled with glue alone. And he points to three reasons why miter joints typically fail. First, if the angle of the miter is off, the mating parts won't properly mate. Gaps reduce gluing surface. Second, the mitered end grain may soak up the glue before it has time to dry, starving the joint. This can be remedied by applying a coat of glue to the ends of your parts, letting them dry, and then apply more glue before assembly. And finally, wood movement can cause miter joints to fail, especially on frames. But since the grain usually runs in the same direction on box sides, they present a far less problem. This is why he rarely uses splines to reinforce his small mitered boxes. So, if you're having trouble with your miter joints, you might try applying these tips before calling in the reinforcements. Looking for a way to hold up your pants that befits a true woodworker? Then you might want to attend Fashion Week in Paris. St. Louis woodworker Colin Garrity has designed a series of wooden belts made from three layers of veneer and features a wooden button for loosening after a big meal. Of course, such high fashion doesn't come cheap. The belts are expected to sell for $800 each, but they're the biggest thing to hit the models since Ray Rice. Oh, Chris Schwartz, you're such a tease. For weeks, he's been talking about his new tool chest project. It's a collaboration he's doing with Jamil Abraham of Benchcrafted and blacksmith Peter Ross. The problem is, the photos he keeps posting only show the outside of the box, while the inside is said to feature a unique carved microtree design. When will you just open up the stinking lid and let us see what all the hype is about? He promises a reveal in an upcoming issue of Popular Woodworking Magazine, but I think the teasing goes a little too far. You don't see me tantalizing people by posting bits of my shirtless photo shoot I did for my upcoming book, because I know it's not fair to get folks riled up with anticipation. A picture might say a thousand words, but all that tool chest is saying to me is, na 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 boo boo, you can't see me for another month or two. Chris's recent blog wasn't just about showing off his chest. He made some excellent points about collaborating with other woodworkers. If you're looking into collaborating, he recommends joining a local woodworking club to meet prospective partners. If you're into hand tools, go to one of the Lee Nielsen Toolworks events. But he warns that some woodworkers, uh, they're afraid to collaborate simply because they don't think their work is good enough. So don't take it personally if you get some rejections. You can read more at the link in the show notes. Does your wife really need another wooden jewelry box? That's the question that faced New York craftsman John Rokanova a few years ago. After filling his home with his wooden wares, he was running out of things to build, so he began selling his work. Now, what to do with all that extra cash? How about giving it away? Well, that's just what John and his wife have been doing. So far, they've donated more than $30,000 to causes in Kenya and Haiti. If you'd like to learn more or are interested in doing something similar yourself, you find a link to a fine woodworking blog about John in the show notes below. Will Myers wants to help you build a portable Moravian workbench. Will is an instructor at the Roy Underhills Woodwright School in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, where they recently brought in the cameras to produce a DVD that walks you through the entire project using nothing but hand tools. 
If you're new to hand tool woodworking, this is a perfect opportunity to learn from one of the best, and you'll build a great bench at the same time. If you're already a skilled hand tool woodworker, you'll still enjoy learning about the design of this historic piece. The DVD, or digital download, is now available through shopwoodworking.com. For the last few months, saw stop fans have been eagerly anticipating the release of the new job site saw. Well, saw stop is finally beginning to ship them out. On-site carpenters, contractors, and remodelers can take advantage of saw stop's unparalleled safety features in a lighter weight, compact package. But it isn't all about keeping your hot dog safe. There are several innovations included that are unique to their design, such as a knob that can completely raise or lower the blade in a single turn an expandable table with a hidden drawer underneath, and a fence with a built-in flip-out shelf support. I've not tried out the new saw, so I can't speak to its quality, but Woodcraft is hosting demos this month in many of their stores. SawStop is also bringing back their popular $200 free accessory deal for March and April purchases. Woodworking in America 2015 is just months away, and Popular Woodworking has released their list of featured speakers. Christopher Schwartz, Dave Marks, Mark Adams, Tom Fidgen, our own Stumpy Nubs, Roy Underhill, Jeff Miller, W. Patrick Edwards, Phil Lowe, Jared Stone Dahl, Alf Sharp, Don Williams, Mike Seamson, Vic Teslin, Denob Polchelski, Kevin Drax, Dave Jeske, Megan Fitzpatrick, Mark Carell, Nick Lawrence and Donna Hill make up the star-studded lineup. If you're going to be anywhere near Kansas City, Missouri this September, you'll want to stop by and check this out. Where is Robert Lang? The 360 woodworking threesome has been a twosome lately, leading many to ask, what about Bob? The situation first came to light on the February 12th podcast when Chuck Bender and Glenn Huey began by saying Bob wouldn't be with them because he was under the weather. On the 17th, they said he was, quote, still under the weather. But by February 19th, they had stopped talking about him altogether. On the 24th, they replaced him with a guest. And on March 3rd, they replaced the guest with another guest. Then, on the March 5th podcast, they removed Lang's name from the introduction and the web page synopsis. No one I've talked to has heard from him since. Is something fishy going on at 360 Woodworking? Did Glenn and Chuck kill Bob for his tools? And if so, how do they plan on getting away with it? Will they drag his body with them to the woodworking shows like that guy on Weekend at Bernie's? I think his name was Bernie? We'll get to the bottom of this, so stay tuned to Behind the Sawdust for updates. Meanwhile, Glenn Huey and Chuck Bender gave us some insight into their sharpening methods. You might think the pros like them have some special secrets or a collection of expensive machines and jigs, but that's not the case. Chuck hollow grinds his chisels on a bench grinder, then hones them freehand on a Japanese water stone. Glenn is a big fan of the work sharp system, which he's used for years. Neither of them have complicated jigs. They think the ruler trick is useless, and they don't see much point in honing a secondary micro bevel either. Why would they need sharp tools? Could it be they have a body to cut up? <laughs> I'm just asking. Mark the Wood Whisperer says it's a great time to join his guild. The reason is that new members get to learn three projects. The three projects currently on schedule would cost them over $300 if the classes were purchased separately, but subscribers get them for just $129. They include a modern chest of drawers and a nightstand set, a Maloof-style sculptured rocking chair, and a gaming dining table combo. You can find more details at the link below in the show notes. Has it really been that long? That's what Paul Sellers is asking himself these days. The hand tool aficionado taught his first class 25 years ago this month. It was a different world back then. Saddam Hussein was in Kuwait, Home Alone was in theaters, and Edward Scissorhands provided most people's introduction to hand tools. The old-timey woodworking revolution we've seen in recent years was in its infancy. So, a man with a European accent trying to set up a woodworking class in Texas without power tools seemed like a recipe for failure. Well, 25 years and over 5,500 students later, Paul has proven the doubters wrong. 
If you look in the show notes, you'll find a link to an article Paul wrote looking back on his career. I think you'll enjoy it. The woodworking shows will be in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on March 13th through the 15th. Attendees will enjoy browsing through the nearly 60 booths staffed with the biggest brands in the industry. And there will also be 60 classes taught by the biggest names in the craft. As always, reserved tickets are just $10, or you can get in for $12 at the door. But bring cash. Nobody wants to stand in line behind you while you search for your glasses and repeatedly drop your pen as you try to write a $12 check something I recently learned at the grocery store. I have here a copy of the seminar schedule for the Milwaukee show, and Robert Lang is scheduled to teach, so I haven't removed him from the brochure. It don't look that good, though. One guy who always takes a good picture is George from Woodworkers Guild of America. And for a long time, George has been the face of the guild. Well, now he has some help. Tom Casper, a former editor from American Woodworking Magazine, has signed on as a contributing editor. Tom brings years of experience and a surprising amount of energy for a man of his vintage. While George did win our hearts with his famous stool sample video a couple of years ago, his style wasn't for everyone. I mean, come on, who likes dry, sarcastic humor mixed into woodworking videos? Tom, on the other hand, brings a crazy Doc Brown sort of feel to the videos. I intend to watch both George and Tom to see how this pans out. If you happen to be in Vegas this weekend and just can't find anything to do, you might stop in at the IWPA World of Wood Convention. Over 300 importers and manufacturers of wood products will be there, and the itinerary includes informative educational sessions, networking events, and fun activities. The non-member admission for the three-day event is $1,200. What else are you going to do with your money in Vegas? If you're into doors, China's the place to be this week. The International Door Industry Exhibition is being held in Beijing and features 110,000 square feet of, you guessed it, doors. It's sponsored by the China Wood Industry Association and promises to be a good time for those who enjoy opening or closing doors, as well as anyone interested in hinges and knobs. But if locks are more your thing, you may not be welcome, you twisted freak. Filmmaker Elliot Forge doesn't get the credit he deserves. His small body of work is absolutely stunning. And the best part is that six of his seven short films feature wood. His latest is about an English woodturner, Leo Singleton. The camera captures the craftsman and his environment as he turns a bowl on a spring pole lathe using homemade tools. We don't report a lot on videos here on Behind the Sawdust, but this one is too good to miss. You'll find a link in the show notes. John Silva of NantucketTurnings.com has been fighting with dust collection for years, and he's tired of twisting arms. So he's come up with a solution. He calls it the Articulated Dust Collector Arm, and it may be just the thing to suck up your lathe shavings. His goal was to get the hose as close to his work as possible without taking up a lot of space. The arm attaches to the back of your stand and it's fully adjustable. If you're a turner looking for a solution that sucks, you should check out his free tutorial and build an articulated arm of your own. Scroll sawing is kind of like driving a car. That's what Scroll Saw Woodworking and Crafts editor Shannon Flowers says. Many years ago, she took a class taught by Ron Poston. And he explained that when you drive a car and you veer across the white line on the road, you don't just harshly jerk your wheel to get back on the track unless you want your car to uh, drive better upside down. So the same is true when you stray from your skull saw pattern line. Your mistake will be a whole lot less noticeable if you make a gradual correction. He also said that when you drive a car, you don't just watch the pavement right in front of the bumper. In the same way, scroll sawers must keep an eye on what's ahead of them so they'll be prepared for changes in their pattern path. Shannon's Back to Basic article includes several more useful tips and is well worth the read before your next scroll saw project. It's already made me a better driver. It's exceeded their expectations, folks. That's according to the publishers of Woodsmith Magazine. After releasing their first Guild edition to kick off 2015, 
They asked readers to weigh in about the new look and the larger size. Editorial director Brian Nelson said that the response was so overwhelming that he had to send out form letters asking for more details. Evidently, the biggest complaint was that the new issue didn't come pre-punched for ring binders like all of their previous issues. Their solution was to post a simple jig on their website so subscribers can drill the holes themselves. While I do always enjoy hearing a company say fix it yourself, and a form letter response does say we care about your feedback, I'm still disappointed that they stopped publishing Shop Notes magazine. I wonder if they have a jig to fill the empty place that decision has left in my soul. This just in. A Google search has turned up no information on the whereabouts of Robert Lang. Our investigators have been typing in the most likely phrase combinations, including Ohio Workshop Massacre and Glenn Huey indicted for murder. But nothing has turned up. We'll keep looking while you keep watching. It looks like the scam is spreading. For several weeks, we've been reporting on the subscription scam targeting scroll sars and woodcarvers. Well, now it's spread to woodworkers too. Wood Magazine subscribers have been getting fraudulent invoices in the mail asking them to renew their subscriptions. The problem is the payment goes to one of several addresses, usually in Florida, and none of which are the actual publisher of the journal. Wood Magazine is reminding their readers that all subscription renewal forms that they send out are attached to the actual magazine. And should you find one that asks for payment to be sent to any address other than theirs, you should contact them immediately. Since the scam is spreading, it won't be long before other journals are affected. So it's a good idea to check the address before paying any of your subscriptions. So far, the most common fraudulent addresses include Rip Ofsky, 123 Gotcha Lane, Sarasota, Florida, and Ivana Cash, 555 Don't Worry This Isn't a Scam Avenue, Daytona Beach. Looking to improve your SketchUp skills? The makers of the popular modeling program have begun posting short videos they're calling SketchUp Skill Builders. They're designed to provide small tips that make a big difference. Woodworkers love SketchUp because it allows them to refine their designs by digitally building their projects before making their first cut. If you're one of those woodworkers, you'll want to keep an eye on the SketchUp YouTube channel for all the latest tips. Tracking down missing woodworkers isn't the only thing our investigative team does. We have eyes all over the woodworking world, hiding in dark alleys, digging through trash bins, and pulling skeletons from closets, all in an effort to keep you informed. When we see something that demands investigation, we make it part of a segment we call, We Report, You Decide. All right, so I see these ads from Furniture Medic and the Woodworking Magazines all the time. It says, go against the grain and find your groove, own your own business. And it talks about extensive training and low initial investment, which usually scares me away. So is this thing legit? Well, it's legit, but like most other magazine ads, it's not all that it's made out to be. How so? Well, you know, a lot of woodworkers are looking for something that they can add on to their current business, hey, to make a few extra bucks. Um, you know, let's say you're building cabinets or something else for a customer and you'd like to perhaps add on to another business to uh, fix uh, furniture scratches or do furniture repair. The problem here is, is the amount of investment. You know, the initial franchise fee here is about $30,000. And then on top of that, about another $13,000 for the basic equipment package. And it's not an option. You're required to buy this. And that's addition to all the other additional cost. So really, if you think about it, this isn't an add-on. This is a complete business venture in itself. By the time you get everything up and running, you're likely going to have 50 to 75 grand invested in this. Holy cow. So it, with all that investment, is this even a viable idea? Well, it can be. I mean, there's definitely a market for furniture restoration uh, and repair. And you get some training with the package, but sadly you don't get an exclusive territory. You could be competing with several other people. And they also don't tell you right up front that there's a 7% franchise fee on your net income or your gross income plus a couple hundred bucks a month and other fees so you're going to have to repair a whole lot of furniture to make this uh, a profitable venture are woodworkers even doing this stuff well they say they got 325 franchises up and going already 
I don't know how many of them are making a profit, but the online reviews do seem to say people are satisfied with the quality of work that this franchise produces. How satisfied the franchise owners are in themselves with all those fees, I don't know. That's another subject, I guess. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is not a scam, but it's going to cost you some money. You need a big cash investment, and it's going to take a lot of motivation, like any other business, to make this truly profitable. So there it is, another investigation complete. We've already sent our minions back out, sniffing around for the next edition of We Report, You Decide. American woodworkers are dirty, reckless people. That's according to an article posted on the Lost Art Press blog. Of course, uh, this article was written for Scientific American back in 1869, when the world was a dirty, reckless place. The author goes on to describe the general want of cleanliness and order that appeared to be the rule among the nation's workshops. A worker who actually cared about personal cleanliness would be regarded as a rising man. He says he frequently notices the grimy faces and smutty hands of the workmen on their way to perhaps equally dirty homes. The article goes on to speculate why this is so, making liberal use of generalizations and insults. It's a very entertaining read and well illustrates the ways of our society that have changed in more ways than one. Remember when cordless power drills cost hundreds of dollars and went dead after 10 minutes of use? Times have changed, and now there's a lot of cordless drills available for a wide range of prices. Wood Magazine recently put 13 of the most popular 12-volt models to the test. They include drills from Bosch, Milwaukee, Festool, Makita, Porter Cable, Rigid, DeWalt, Craftsman, Harbor Freight, Ryobi, and Black & Decker. The $150 Bosch PS3202 was their top pick. It drove 460 screws per charge and features a brushless motor, giving it greater torque. In fact, if you're looking for greater torque and longer battery life, brushless seems to be the way to go because the other brushless motor in the test, the Milwaukee 240322, came in second place and it drove 451 screws per charge, while the longest lasting brush motors only drove between 350 and 400 screws. Their top value pick was the Craftsman 17586, which comes in at just $50 and greatly outperformed other drills in that price range. The most expensive drill in the test was the $300 Festool, which rated high in most categories, but lower in torque and runtime per charge. The least expensive drill was the Harbor Freight $45 Chicago Electric 69360, which also rated high in most categories, but lower in charge time and torque. For more details, check out the March issue of Wood Magazine. Speaking of tools, we've got another great one to give away. Our second WorkSharp 3000 goes to Deb Rhodes. Congratulations, Deb. We hope you enjoy your new WorkSharp, and we look forward to hearing what you think. If you didn't win, don't feel bad. We have a lot more great tools to give away. We're going to try and give away one every other week for as long as we can. So next week, we'll tell you how to enter to win another great prize. Well, that about wraps things up for this edition of Behind the Sawdust. The next couple of episodes will be a little shorter than usual, so we have a little bit more time to work on my upcoming book. But we're still going to have lots of great woodworking news, tips, tricks, and tools. Plus, we have a bunch of homemade jigs and machines coming out in the next couple of weeks. So be sure to visit StumpyNubs.com and sign up for that free newsletter. You won't want to miss them. And while you're there, Check out the project plans for some of the coolest stuff you've ever seen. That's how we do what we do here. It's a great place to sit back and have a cold one, because you've earned it, my friend.